Hello and welcome to Task Master Talk Talks with Kevin Sullivan. I am your host, JP John Paz, two man power trip. Of course, joining me, star of the show, the former WCW and ECW World Tag Team Champion, one of the greatest minds and bookers ever in the history of the business, the Games Master, the Taskmaster, the Devil himself, Mr. Kevin Sullivan. Kevin, how are you doing today, sir? Great, JP. I'm doing excellent. I'm just down. At Outlaw Wrestling with Bull James, he's got a great crew of guys there. Excellent crew there, excellent shows. So uh, I had a great weekend. Do you see some good talent coming out of that yeah, organization? Great, there's some great talent there. I'll tell you what, I saw Crowbar wrestle, and Crowbar has stopped the hands of time he, he had an incredible match he had an incredible match and uh, they did very well they ran in Brooklyn and you know now Brooklyn's the hot spot right in the country just about and they had a jam packed show uh, who was at a little uh, church arena and uh, they were like yourself, JP, they were hipsters going there, you know what I mean? And they were drinking their pap <laughs> blue ribbon. Yep. And they had about 600 people there, and they really appreciated the wrestling. It was very good. Are they like, kind of old school fans, new school fans? What what kind of uh, you know wrestling I, I, do they like? Well, I, it, they he, Bull runs a very good ship where he gives a little bit of everything, but what I enjoyed is that the people enjoyed the hard work the guys put in. And rather than just chanting, they would applaud. You know what I mean? So they must have been wrestling fans at one time in the youth. So it was interesting. It was very interesting. Do they the appreciate other, the old school guys? Yes, they did. They, uh, Crow, Crowbar had people on his the feet the whole time and they loved them and I think their next show is like the 29th of June so uh, good luck to Bull he's a great guy and uh, he runs a very very well organized show were you hanging out with Ace Fraley at all no they were on tour in uh, Arizona with uh Andrew went there. They were in Arizona and Louisiana, I believe. Because I think I saw a photo. I guess it was an old photo, but it was you hanging out with uh, Ace Fraley. Yeah, we were. Uh, it was strange. You know, I live up in the islands, and the, on the mainland, there's a town right across from our island. And he was playing there in an old wonderful theater you know great acoustics uh, that was the first time i've ever seen him play i went over a friend of mine and they you know they really treated us great we had a great time is andrew part of his like security staff yeah andrew's the head uh security guard yep wow what a gig yeah yeah how the hell did he get that He's known Ace for years. And uh, he goes up to Ace's house all the time. He got a... Uh, it's a hell of a gig. Uh, you know, he gets paid big money every day. And, uh, I mean, everything's... You know, he doesn't have to pay spring for anything. So good for him. Andrew is, is a good guy. So what were you doing specifically? Were you managing uh, guys? I was actually there to see the show, but I came out with Crowbar, and uh, I was there to kind of help Bull out. But he did a great job. He didn't need much help, that's for sure. He did a magnificent job. If any of uh, the wrestlers that will listen to this you should get a hold of Bull and give him a call. He puts on terrific shows, and he's honest. 
and he's a good guy, and you get paid. So I saw he how he treated all the guys. He treats them no different than anybody else, meaning I don't care who you are, you get treated the same. He's a great guy, great guy. So really, the topic at hand for today's episode, Slambury 2000, WW Slambury 2000, which was held on May 7th, 2000, Kansas City, Missouri at Kemper Arena, the attendance 7165, so 7,165, and the pay-per-view buys only 65,000, ouch. Where were you at this point, May of 2000? I was home fishing. Yeah. Are you watching? No, 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 uh, you know, uh, I, if you don't have any background, uh, it's hard if you've been in the office and you know what's going on, whether you're just in the office or you're booking or writing or being an agent, when you don't hear any of that you, you can't that you think what should go so I didn't watch it no but I'm, I'm going to love to go over this with you now were you frustrated all that you're home or you're happy that you're home and fishing and hanging out I had three years getting paid you tell me <laughs> you're probably loving it yeah yeah, got to, you know, fish and dive and go to Europe and a lot of nice things. Does anybody give you tabs on, like, what's going on? Like, hey, did you see this? Hey, this is, like, what's going on? Uh, at first, Kevin would, but then he, he would call and I'd say, no, I didn't watch it. So I think he got the message, you know. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Just curious of, like, um, yeah, like obviously we're going to get your opinion on the show, but I'm just curious, like what some of the old school guys' mindset is, because obviously it's the Russo Bischoff era with a lot of Russo um, backing here. Although obviously he's writing the shows here, and I guess Eric is really giving the, the thumbs up on them. But it just seems like a very different era for WCW and what's going on here. Like I don't know the, the way Hogan's booked. I know the whole Billy Kidman thing. We talked about that before, but just. I don't know, the way some of the older guys are booked, it just seems like, I don't know, not the same old WCW. From what I've heard from Eric, he was, like, told to keep his hands off unless he saw something that was maybe completely out of whack. So I think Eric was giving Russo a chance. Now, I don't know if you were told this. I'm sure maybe Nash maybe called you, but um, David Arquette at this point is the WCW World Heavyweight Championship uh, champion. He won the championship on Thunder. He pinned Bischoff. It was a tag match for the tag titles. So it was Bischoff and Jared against DDP and uh, David Arquette. David Arquette ends up pinning Bischoff. What did you think about Arquette being the world champion? Yeah, I think it was the hard, worst thing in the business. Now, second worst thing. You know how everybody criticizes bookers when they win the world title? Yep. I mean, they take them and, and crucify them, don't they? Yes. Dusty, Flair, Nash, everybody, right? Yep. How come I don't hear that about Vinny Russo? Was he world I, champion? Yeah, unfortunately, yeah, that was and that was, was he horrible. World champion against Goldberg. Uh, it was a, a somewhat of a like. Luckily, it care. happened. Goldberg speared him. Yeah, horrible. Yeah, yeah. I don't care. <laughs> you, I mean, uh, that'd be like if uh, no disrespect to you, JP, but you're the you the quarterback goes down the Super Bowl. Mahone goes down, they put you in, and you beat Brady. Just doesn't make sense. That's the best feud of all time for Austin McMahon. I, I, I know that, and I've 
seen. Hey, I know he didn't want to win it. Didn't he give the money to film his family? I mean, the guy's a stand-up guy. What are you going to and what are you going to say if the you're coming in and doing your dream job, and the boss tells you you're going to win, and you're saying no because you don't want to get anybody hot at you, but you know you're going to get all that heat. I think he 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 tried to do the right thing, and it was impossible to do the right thing. I mean, uh, I'm sure this thing was going to be, it's going to go mainstream. But there's going mainstream with something good and going mainstream with something that's the shits. Russo, I believe, and maybe other people involved, trying to get their hands on Hollywood people. Uh, what's the kid that wrestled in WrestleMania, John Paul, the Logan Paul. I got to give him a lot of credit. He's an athlete. He challenges he challenges everybody. Yet he really trained to be a wrestler. You saw that when he gave him the Guerrero splash, right? I, I think you know. Nobody thought Shivani, they said Shivani came up with that idea. We all don't hit a home run at the time out, so. Uh, but what you said after, after that, everything went downhill. So. I still think there might have been uh, some rehearsals for uh, Rope Opera, don't you? Yeah. It became a laughing stock, you know. And then you know you're in deep cold water. It's hard to get people back. Hogan once told me something. He said, "You can make mistakes, but you can't make too many mistakes." And he was right. Yet everybody can be tricked into it, like him and the Kidman angle and. The Jared Angle and Hulk, I mean, they really choked the golden goose that got them there, didn't they? Uh, it sounds like to me someone was playing to the, his own crew. He he didn't think he could handle head-to-head -head with some of those guys, so... You get the young guys and everybody, you know, here's the thing. I'm sure all the young guys think that we're being held back, right? Now some of those young guys are 25 years in the business and they're still on top. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, uh, so uh, whoever was booking it played to the... Uh, hometown audience to get them to and the other guys probably decided ah, oh, we're not going to fight this we'll see where it goes what about building guys up first like the new blood and guys of that ilk don't you have to build them up a little bit first you have to build everybody up but especially guys like that i mean you know i always equate them to boxing right have have you ever seen uh Mike Tyson, beginner of his career. Remember how they gave him that one guy, uh, Fer Ferguson? I think it was Jesse Ferguson. Mike had about 11 fights, and they gave him Jesse Ferguson. And Jesse Ferguson was a fringe top 10 fighter. And he stood up to Mike for two rounds, and then Mike just destroyed him. And then next came Mitch Green when they shot the angle where they got in a fight outside. Do you remember that? They built Mike, and then when he finally got there, here is Michael Spinks, who, if he wins, is going to tie Rocky Marciusek 
a record of 49 wins and no defeats. And Mike destroys him in one round. That's how you build people. Yeah. You need somebody and to do it just to do it. You got to look at the long range effects it's going to have. What about the new blood name? Do you like the name in new blood? And do you like the name, the millionaires club? I don't like the name, but I like how you integrate younger guys to get them the rub. But you can't destroy the older talent on the way to doing it. But they should be passing the torch. But like Barry and Rick in the desert, right? Remember they did that? That was a little fuck you, wasn't it? It was a, you know, everybody's been trying to get rid of Rick Flair. He's still going to be working next month, right? They've been trying to get rid of him since 1989. And he still keeps on ticking. But to bury a guy that does it, that's a real Freudian slip. Well, I, I know it's going to happen. Well, speaking of Rick wrestling, what do you think about his final match, which is obviously part of StarCast and JCP Promotions, 731? It's going to be Flair either in a singles or maybe in a six-man tag. I know it's in his blood, but I just worry that he'll be one of the guys that this won't be the last match. He'll get the the adrenaline going, and he'll have a good match. He's got the great opponents. And, you know, what I worry about is him taking a bump and jar and something in sock. Yeah, I didn't realize they had a pacemaker. But, I mean, come on. He doesn't. Eh, I don't, I mean, he, it's going to draw because everybody, the novelty, but you know, Luthez came back at 74, and he had a hell of a match. Uh, was it? Who was it with? Chono? It was Masahiro Chono, his protege, and it was a part of New Japan Pro Wrestling Show. Yeah. And they tried to do the uh, double bridge and lose artificial hip one out. You know what I mean? But, uh, he, Lou didn't have any real serious internal problems, so Brick doesn't get hurt. Oh, I do too. I do too. I mean, and he has one of the greatest teams of all time, the Rock and Roll Express, and one of his his greatest opponents, Ricky Steamboat, right? Steamboat came out and said in, in an interview, I guess it was with High Spots or somebody, and he said he will not be a part of the match. So a little bit of controversy there. I don't know if he's just saying that or if it's health reasons, but his last match on TV was against Chris Jericho. He wants to kind of leave that memory alive to the fans. He's also 69 years old, and he's not in, like, pristine condition. He's almost 70. So he probably will not be wrestling, or he says he will not be wrestling. Oh, really? Let's talk about the topic at hand. WCW Slambury 2000. On May 7th, 2000, Kansas City, Missouri at the Kemper Arena. The attendance, 7,165, and the pay-per-view buys only 65,000. So not good there. And this is, of course, the first pay-per-view event that they were having anywhere here in, in Kansas City after the Owen Hart death at Over the Edge 99. So this is the first pay-per-view, and it's with WSW, of course, after the incident with Owen Hart and Kemper Arena. The announcers are Tony Schiavone, Mark Madden, and Mr. Scott Hudson. I love Scott Hudson. I think he's very, very good. He comes at, at it as a conquer. And Mark, Mark has, you know, some notoriety. And I, I, I like when you see different sets of announcers change up once in a while. I mean, you don't have to do it all the time, but I think they they would work together well. Like I said, I didn't see it, but I'm sure the three of them would work together well. 
And the first match up, Chris Candido with Tammy Lynn Sitch defeats The Artist with Paige Lee. The match goes eight minutes. Decent match here. Candido retains his WWE Cruiserweight Championship. And, of course, like I mentioned, Tammy, a.k.a. Sonny, is out there as the manager of Chris Candido. I knew her before she drank in Smoky Mountains. I used to work in Japan. And when I was off, I'd go up there and help Jimmy out once in a while. Something has happened to her in her life that caused this addiction problem. Whether she can't get over not being in the limelight. Chris is dead. Um, money problems, health problems, age problems. Somebody and I'm not saying it's WWF problem to do this. Based on the rehab of the notifications. But someone in her family should have got a psychiatrist, psychologist. And I don't understand how she could get those many DUIs without them putting in a blow you know the blower in the car? Yep. I mean, I know in the state, at least the county I'm in, Island County, you get one DUI, you got to get a blower in your car. And if you can't ride, you can drive anybody else's car. I mean, crazy, crazy that she can get that many, yeah. Uh, you know, her life is over. What I think I, I saw that she's 49. And she's going to get up to 30 years. Yep. Pretty accurate, I mean, yeah. Yeah, pretty, pretty scary. Pretty scary. And I just saw something on... You know those uh, television programs, Ted, where they, you get these very smart people who talk about different subjects? Oh, yeah, Ted Talks, yep. Okay. Do you know who the original Tesla was, right? Not the car, but Tesla? Yes. Okay. You know, he's a genius, right? Yep. And, you know, he, he beat Edison to electricity and then all that other stuff. His granddaughter got into science because he was an addict from alcohol. And she has done a different study on addiction that your brain actually changes for some people like you and I could go out and have a drink and after a certain period of time maybe your brain would change and mine wouldn't that you had to have it so I mean she had to have a lot of the neighborless you know what I mean to say oh tell me why don't you have a drink you know what I mean and then give her the keys I just don't understand that I mean I, I think about it you know one of the driving forces for all this was the mothers against drunk drivers, you know, mad. Mm -hmm. Yep. Back in the day, you know, the police would take the alcohol and they would drive you, tell you move over, they'd drive you home. You know what I mean? I think it's because a lot of people, you know, the people were aware that people were getting killed from alcohol and accidents but not as overwhelming as it is people didn't have that kind of reached out with the news like we do now you know what I mean can't get away from anything but somebody should have taken her aside and helped her because she killed a guy his life's gone people that loved him was going to be uh saddled with that and she's going to jail and her life is basically gone 
And I'm sure at one point, wasn't she studying to be a doctor? Wasn't she finished? Didn't she finish nursing school at one time? I thought she was going to become a nurse. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she was going to do good for people. I mean, we all have a path. And uh, life is hard. And I, I mean, I hear everybody knocking on all this shit. Well, yeah, she did something horrible. Someone has lost the grandfather and father. But she put her life in jeopardy when she got behind the car that night. But she did it time and time again before that. It was just a matter of time. And nobody that was around us said, you can't do it. I don't know. I just wish uh, it could have turned out better for her and for the guy that died, too, and his family. So Chris Candido ends up getting the win here, defeating the artist in about eight minutes. Um, okay, match, nothing great here. Just a, a weird kind of screw up with uh, with Mickey J. It was weird. Like he counted three, the bell rang, and then he said he didn't count three. So then Candido hits the power driver, hits the headbutt, and pins him again, and he wins. So some little bit of a miscommunication there, a little bit of a screw up. But it was just uh, Candido getting the win over your buddy, the artist. Nothing to write home about, though. Yeah, I would wonder why they would do that. Mickey's pretty was a you know another one that we just lost. That was from COVID. Uh, he lost sixty pounds in three weeks. Oh my God! Yeah, so you couldn't told me about it. I mean, he couldn't even breathe. Uh, Mickey was a shop referee. I don't think. I think someone's trying to outsmart the people and with that one. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, they always try to do that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So then the next match, Terry Funk retains his hardcore championship, defeating Norman Smiley and Ralphus in about 10 minutes. Okay. You know, pretty entertaining. Nothing, you know, great to write home about here. Uh, Ralphus was shirtless for most of the match, which was interesting. Uh, he's not in the greatest shape in, in the world, but Funk and Norman try to make the best of it. Bit of a comedy spot there with uh, with I Ralphus. Love, I love Norman. He's a, you know, have you ever seen some of his matches when he was a big star in Mexico? Oh yeah, he's a hell of a worker. Oh, he's incredible. Why would you saddle them with that gimmick against Terry Funk and then try to bring Terry's down with Ralphus? We've explained for generations that Terry Funk is middle-aged and crazy, and you're crazy to get in the ring with him. Then you have Norma, who screams, and Ralphus, who you were kind to say he's not in that good of a shape. But, I mean, to me, that just does another expose in the business. You got a guy, Terry Funk, that's a business changer. He can come into a territory that's dead and move the needle. We talked about him and Flair. Flair went from being the most hated heel to 10 seconds later, he's most beloved babyface. That was because of Terry and Ricky, but Terry. Terry's uh, one of the most exceptional wrestlers of any generation. That was he wasn't in my opinion used well. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't see the match. Great. So then up next, David Arquette is in the back with Mean Gene Okerlund. Mean Gene, instead of talking to him about the title and the champion, he's asking about his wife, Courtney Cox, who was Monica on Friends. And, you know, they're really, you know, he's really nervous about the Triple Cage match because that's going to be the main event with DDP himself and Jeff Jarrett. They're really kind of at least presenting him like he's not credible. He's not a threat. He's just like a, a joke champion. And he kind of goes along with it for the most part. I mean, he's... He's not acting like he's like the uh, the real world champion or anything. Right, right. And uh, 
I gotta give them credit. I gotta give them credit. I feel like they used them. He yep. shouldn't have been in that spot. I think he was used. He told them that he didn't want to do that. So, you know, he had better sense than they did, maybe. What do you think? Yeah, I feel like he wasn't comfortable being like the champion. He wasn't comfortable in, in that role that they put him in. Yeah, I think he was uh, actually, I think he was embarrassed. From what I've read and seen him on interviews about it. Yeah, he definitely didn't want to be champ. I know that. Yeah. Yeah. So Sean Stasiak is up next. He'll defeat Mr. Perfect, Kurt Hennig, in about eight minutes. Okay, match. Nothing great here. Nothing to write home about. Stasiak is actually, you know, he's kind of green at this point. And obviously, Hennig is not the Mr. Perfect of old. We get the new blood getting a win over the Millionaires Club. What do you think about, you know, kind of moving perfect off to the side and giving Stasiak a big win here on pay-per-view. Well, you said that Henning wasn't the same as the perfect. It's kind of hard to be the same as the perfect when you know they're doing something wrong and you've seen Terry Funk be made a fool of. It's true. <laughs> At this time, guys that have been in the business and drew money know the writing's on the wall. And kind of just another little funny thing about the whole new new blood millionaires club. So Scott Steiner's really kind of was a tweener at first. He didn't wasn't aligned to each group, and then he joins in with New Blood. But it's funny, okay? It's two thousand. Steiner really made his debut in you know, basically the mid to late eighties. So he'd been wrestling for like 14 years at this point. I don't know if that necessarily would scream new blood, you know, <laughs> yeah, a guy's yeah. been around for 14, 15 years. Yeah. And you're right. He has been around. I mean, you said it in the, at the latest, the mid eighties, he started with the bru- bruiser. So he'd been in the business probably from 83. So Scotty so Steiner, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's he was in the business for a while. So Scotty Steiner, I don't know. If he, you know, he doesn't scream new blood. Definitely not. No, no, no. And he's, he's been up. wrestling on top for there for years. Yeah. Yep. So he's up next. He's the U.S. champion. He's got the beautiful Medeja with him. He's got Shakira with him, and he's going to defeat. Captain UG Rection via submission in about nine minutes. Pretty good match here from Steiner and Bill DeMott. But it's funny to note that before the match started, Hugh Morris got on the mic and said, I'm no longer Hugh Morris. Eric Bischoff gave me that name five years ago. He did that to make me look stupid. Now I want to go by my real name, Hugh G. Rection, or you can just call me Captain Rection. So it's like he's got this serious promo. What's his name going to be? And it's Hugh G. Rection. Watching a preview for Rope Upper? Seems to me we are. Yeah. Very, very sure. jokey. Like, okay, Hugh Morris, like, that's not a great name, but it's not huge erection. Huge erection is terrible. JP, it certainly sounds like a, it looks like a sitcom to me. Way too jokey, definitely. But uh, the match itself was, was not bad as, as Steiner went to the Steiner recliner. But kind of, you know, you expect that from those two. Then, the yeah. I saw him in Japan and brought him in right away. Yep. He was crashed the Terminator, right? Right. Pretty nimble, pretty good for a big guy, you know? He's a pretty good worker. So, yeah. JP. So, yes. I'm sorry. So, I'm sorry. so. Yeah, no problem. So the next matchup, Mike Awesome versus Chris Canyon ends in a no contest. It was actually really good while the while last the match goes about 12 minutes. Um, it was kind of um, 
rolling in, into what, what could have been a, a good match. Canyon re- really, I don't know, like, um, I don't know, when, when Canyon could get going, he's good. When Mike Awesome get the right opponent, he's good. It, it just it ends in a no contest, and really it's because Kevin Nash kind of comes out. Um, the Ric Flair comes out, the New Blood comes out, all these guys trying to, uh, to make the save and just gets ruled and thrown, uh, thrown out into a no contest is basically Nash kind of um, just interrupted the match. Well, let me ask you this. Is Awesome not the 70s guy? Not yet. So at this point, he's still being booked as a killer. Like he made his debut, he took out Nash, he injured Nash. So he's like, he's still being just Mike Awesome, no stupid gimmicky name. He's kind of a killer. And it's funny here, Nash hits him first. So really, Awesome should have won by DQ, but they call it a no contest. Okay, let me ask you something. How much longer was it till that '70s show came on TV? That '70s show, hmm. To me, it sounds like a ripoff. It, to me, it sounds like, again, uh, a recital or a, or you got a rehearsal for a comedy show. Yeah, so that 70s show debuted in 1998. He would become that 70s guy basically four months after this. So three or four months after this pay-per-view. So he'd eventually go into that gimmick, which was terrible. So you have a guy that's wife had one of the biggest sitcoms of all times. You got him who's really wants to be a wrestler. And now you've destroyed Terry Funk. Uh, you got a huge erection. You got the seventies guy coming up. And you started something on a pay-per-view with a screw-up that you thought you were going to do that was smart. To me, this is your audition and your, your soap opera. The next matchup, the total package, Lex Luger with Elizabeth defeats Buff Bagwell by submission. Uh, basically, nine minutes, 30 seconds. Nothing great here. Nothing to write home about. Um The thing that happens after the match, though, Chuck Palumbo comes down, and he's wearing Luger's gear. He beats up Luger, and he puts him in the torture rack. So not only earlier in the night did we have Stasiak, who is actually becoming Perfect Sean and stealing Mr. Perfect's gimmick, now we have Chuck Palumbo debuting, and he's taking Luger's gimmick. Do you like this guy's debuting and kind of doing the same storyline twice and on the same pay-per-view where a young guy beats an older guy and then takes his gimmick? Again. What do they call it? Uh, a stand-in, the study, you know, on, on on Broadway when they have a play, and they say tonight, standing in for uh, Marla Brando is whoever. Do you know what I'm saying? Do you get what I'm saying? Yep. It's like th- he, this was all. A- uh, a rehearsal for a show, and if you don't like this guy playing the character, we got this one. Which one do you like? To me, it was a depra- desperate attempt to get a show on the air. I may be completely nuts, and a lot of people think so, but I don't know. Doesn't seem to do much for wrestling. Do you think booking wise, that's just an easy way out for like the the young guys? It's like, ah, we'll just give him an established gimmick and have him beat up the guy and quote unquote steal his gimmick. Is that like a, a good booking, bad booking, or just just lazy? Well, I'm not going to say it's lazy. I think it was an alternative motive. But just out, outside of that, though, when you actually like look at that without thinking oh, of, of that, do you think like? Well, Per se, the booking, like, eh, I don't know about that booking. You're stealing the guys. But not only that, you're you're doing it twice in the same night. But you hit it on the head when you said that you got to build people up. You could have done this, maybe. You could end up with hole versus hole, but not twice out of the box. And, you know, you, you did hit it on the, the nail on the head, J.P., 
you can't do this first guy, first night the guy's down there. Palumpo, didn't you say that? Mm-hmm. He was debuting? Yep. Nobody knows who he is. How's he going to get over? Good point. Go back to Goldberg. How do I get him over? Spare a jack number. That simple. And fed him. So the, well, before we get to the next match, Shane Douglas, the franchise in the back, and he's cutting a promo on the Nature Boy. It's funny, too, because he's new blood, and we all know Shane debuted in, in the mid-'80s, too. So it's funny. It's like, how oh, he's been around 15 years. He's new blood. It's yeah. just uh, it's funny the way that some of the guys are new blood and some of the guys aren't. Yeah, I mean, I didn't see it, but obviously, you know, like you said, we said Steiner has been around at least 14, 15 years. And the franchise, too. I mean, so they're not, and they've been on TV forever, right? Yep. So they're not new blood. So the franchise, Shane Douglas, ends up defeating Ric Flair, of all people. Not a bad match. It was actually a pretty good match. Went about nine minutes. Of course, he doesn't win. Um, you know, you know, straight up, it's not a clean finish. David Flair, dressed up as Sting, ends up interfering and cheating and helping Shane Douglas win. There was a stipulation to the match as well that if Russo had interfered, that Flair would get five minutes along with Russo, who was kind of involved with Luger's storyline. Now he's involved with the Flair storyline. Just an interesting thing. Douglas finally gets the win over Flair. What, what do you think here with David Flair, of, of all people, helping Shane Douglas beat his father? I just don't like brother against brother, and I really hate father against son. And you're going to take poor David, who's green as grass, and put him in with his father, arguably one of the greatest wrestlers of all times. Just, I mean, there's an alternative motive going on here. Get rid of the old guys. Have the young guys want to do anything you say? It's a Jim Jones experiment gone horribly wrong. Not good there. What do you think about Shane and Flair finally getting a wrestle here? Shane gets the win, but it really almost like didn't matter because it was like the backdrop for David and, and Russo and Flair and like that feud. So what do you think about Shane, his real life heat with, with Flair? After all these years, Everybody knew about Shane's interviews, and everybody knew about Rick chastising Shane. They could have gotten some interviews done for weeks that would have. And if you had to buy stuff from Paulie back then and show some of the interviews and all this, you could have really built that up and made it mean something. And if you wanted to, if Rick wanted to, Having another opponent, he could have slipped Shane over, and now the the new bloods, the young bloods, or whatever they're called, they get a victory over Ric Flair, and it's clean. I mean, just throw stuff together, you know, it doesn't work. Do you think that it was justified, the heat, the real-life heat with Shane and Flyer on Shane's side? I'm not sure. I mean, I don't really know what happened. Uh, you tell me what you – there's a little bit that I know of. So basically, Shane – was supposed to be getting a push, not a push, but like better uh, spot in WCW. Supposedly, Flair's on top, Flair's in charge. He kind of nicks it. Shane has been known to complain about the finish. He denies it, but even Cornette said he complained about a finish and went above Flair's head 
to complain about the finish to Jim Hurd, and Jim Hurd got it changed, and he told Flair to change it, like, instead of going to Rick. So that created, like, a, a big issue, but Shane also just didn't like the way Flair was booking him. And then Shane asked Flair to watch one of his matches, and Flair said that he would, and Shane, he just said, oh, yeah, I did something off the top, and he really never went off the top. He just wanted to test Flair to see if Flair was actually watching the match. Flair gave him just generic, like, yeah, great job. I'll keep doing that move and blah, blah, blah. Then I heard one time, weren't they supposed to have a series of matches at uh, ECW Arena, three of them? No. I believe that. And then, I, I believe that 100%. Do you think Ric Flair, back in that era, would have went into ECW Arena? Absolutely not. Guys tell guys things, and they hope that the guy understands their half-assed bullshit in them, you know. But when you're young, you have a tendency, and when you're on top, you have a tendency to believe everything people say. But again, can you see Rick Flair walking in the front door at ECW Arena? I can't. Dressing in that big dress room back there, nah, nah, it ain't gonna happen. Potentially beat up Rick Flair and Kevin Nash. Like, what the, what is going on here? Not good. No, no, no. If you have a girl knocking a seven foot giant down, yep. that's in the movie business. Okay, I won't say that again. Yeah. 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 And Sting ends up beating Vampiro in seven minutes. Just about a pretty good match here. Just an interesting sidebar. Feels like Vampiro is kind of a wannabe undertaker. Like that's the kind of gimmick that they're throwing at him at this point. The worst thing you can do is try to copy the best thing that the wrestling does. And, yeah, and Vampiro is fabulous, but, you know, you can't. Uh, who replaced Babe Ruth after he retired? Do you know? I don't. You know what I mean? You put my... No, I don't. That's a good question. Yeah. yeah. So, what I'm getting at is you can't replace some guys. Hulk Hogan ends up defeating Billy Kidman. With Tory Wilson, Eric Bischoff is the special guest referee. That match goes about 13 minutes, 30 seconds. What happens is Bischoff is the ref. He gets knocked out. Hogan does the power bomb through the table. Horace Hogan is out there. He helps throw Eric back in the ring, where then Hogan finishes off Kidman. And then Hogan uses Bischoff's hand to count one, two, three, because he's the ref in the match, and that's what he needs to do. Jeff Jarrett defeated David Arquette, the then WCW World Heavy Champion, and DDP in the triple cage match for the WCW World Heavyweight Championship. Pretty good match here. It goes about 15 minutes. The finish saw David Arquette cheat and help Jeff Jarrett win the title. He swerved DDP, which is a Russo thing where you you know you got to have a swerve in the finish. And we get another swerve here as Jeff Jarrett is the new WCW World Heavyweight Champion thanks to David Arquette. Come on, a, a Dustyism, right? The Triple Cage. That was mine. Wow. So okay, where'd you, where'd you come up with that from? Uh, because I we had them in. I don't know if they did it the way I did. I had. Uh, it was like a, it was Dusty and Mulligan against me and Mark. Mark was in a rat cage in the ring that had a cage around it, right? And the D- Dusty was in the other cage. You get my uh, drift? Yep. And I got in the he was on a pole and opened up at Mark, and we were beaten. He, my tights and it slipped out. I missed my tights and it slipped out. And uh, the referee kicked it over to Dusty under the key, cage. And it, it was just another variation getting Dusty's over. And Jack. Yeah, that's tradition. Yeah, 
I see that. I can see that then working because of what you said. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I don't like anything about David having the belt. And it's just too convoluted for me. So after Jared wins after the main event, Chris Canyon comes out to help his friend DDP. He's Canyon the babyface at this point. So he takes, as he's climbing the triple cage, he's on one level of the cage, Jarrett and Mike Awesome end up beating him up. They throw Canyon off the stay off the cage, and he plummets to the entranceway, which gets, it's gimmick, but he, he, he quote-unquote goes through the entranceway and supposedly really injures his neck and his back. So he, it's, it's kind of like a cool spot, and it's like, okay, it's a dangerous spot. But then you think, oh, my God, this is the arena one year ago that Owen Hart, died in and you're doing a stunt where a guy gets thrown off a cage and hurts his neck and his back probably the worst arena to do that spot in modern insulting stuff that was really insulting and kind of unnecessary and unneeded and Canyon is not even you know he's the baby face at this point he's with DDP but why him taking the spot? I mean, it's just totally unnecessary. And especially in that building. People aren't stupid. Wow. Wow. That just turned it all off to me. Yeah, so just kind of thinking back and just listening, what what'd you think? A pretty pretty bad pay-per-view? Or what do you I mean? Some of the matches actually going back and watching weren't that bad. I mean, they're pretty good, but the finishes were very convoluted and obviously well, the, fi- the finish of the main not needed. We started off with a fuck-up, right? Did you say Mickey counted twice? Yes. Then we do a horrible thing like that after Owen's death. I mean, I just, maybe I see things differently. Uh, I think that was not a good thing for the wrestling business, so I don't know. I'm, I'm, I, I mean, I'm not going to, that was the two things I see as a social experiment, but I'm not going to knock anybody that put the time in and effort. We all have different ideas how to get there, but that one's tough for me. What about you? Yeah, it wasn't a great showing. I hate the end. It's totally not needed, especially after Owen Hart. Definitely not needed. There was some other stuff in between where the matches were good, but the finishes, like, not every match needs a schmaz. Not every match needs somebody needs to cheat. You, you know, you got to button stuff up like that. So let's hit the plug. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Two Man Power Trip. Check out the website tnptempire.com. Go to Kevin's Pro Wrestling Tees store, prowrestlingtees.com. And also follow Kevin on Instagram at Taskmaster Talks. Kevin, what else you got going on? I got, uh, I'm going to Toronto this Thursday for three days. Do some signing. Uh, the following week, I'm going to uh, L.A. to do that light side of the ring talk about Honolulu and then from uh, LA I'm flying for signing in Tampa uh, it's at Lutz it's David Penzer's signings he has them a few times a year then I'm going to go uh, on that Sunday for Championship Wrestling from Florida the reboot and sign autographs so I got a busy schedule yeah, you really do. Good stuff. As always, Kevin, thank you, everybody, for listening. See you right back here next week for a little Taskmaster Talks with Kevin Sullivan. We'll see you next week, folks. Thank you for watching The Hannibal TV. Please help me out and like this video. Then click the subscribe and get notifications buttons so you don't miss any of my latest shoot interviews, match videos, or news updates. Follow us on Facebook at The Hannibal TV for more live streams and videos. And while you're at it, follow us on Instagram and Twitter at The Hannibal TV.